Thank you. It's my great pleasure this afternoon to introduce our speaker and my former student, I'm proud to say, Senator Amy Klobuchar. In a revealing anecdote, Senator Klobuchar begins her wonderful new autobiography, The Senator Next Door, with the following passage. I quote, in my early campaigns, people would sometimes come up to me at a grocery store, at a shopping mall, and they'd say, I know you from somewhere. They would look at me intently and ask, is it the PTA? Do you live in my neighborhood? Always trying to be respectful, I would say things like, I don't think so, but maybe you saw me on TV. Uh, I'm running for the United States Senate. No, they'd respond. <laughs> That's not it. Are you sure you don't live down the street? So as the years went on, I figured it was much easier if I just answered, I don't exactly live on your block, but you can always think of me as the senator next door. Hence the title to the memoir. Now building on this notion, Senator Klobuchar goes on to observe, and I should, by the way, add that you should buy the book. It's a terrific read. Um, Senator Klobuchar goes on to observe that politics is at its best when you listen and learn from the people you represent. And in the political arena, a public servant should be expected to work honestly and collaboratively with others who were presumably elected to do the same thing. Now this is a commitment that Senator Klobuchar embodies every day in her public service. But it is, as we all know, sorely lacking in Congress today. In 2006, Amy Klobuchar became the first woman elected to represent the state of Minnesota in the United States Senate, and she has since earned a reputation as an effective legislator willing to reach across the aisle to get things done. Before her election to the Senate, Senator Klobuchar served for eight years as the Hennepin County Attorney in Minnesota, and she currently serves on the Senate Judiciary Committee a position that has enabled her to participate in the confirmation hearings of both Justice Sonia Sotomayor and Justice Elena Kagan, and in the non-confirmation hearings for Just Judge Merrick Garland. <laughs> Senator Klobuchar is a smart, caring, and effective leader who truly exemplifies the very best in American democracy. The Lord knows we need more people like her. Senator Klobuchar. Well, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Jeff, for that warm introduction. Uh, thank you, uh, Carolyn, for your leadership. Uh, Jeff was truly a wonderful uh, professor, and every student that walked in the doors of his class was lucky to have him. Uh, he has been a mentor to me, and I have fond memories of the University of Chicago Law School. Not everyone might say that. Uh, you know, it has kind of a scholarly reputation. Uh, in fact, uh, they have t-shirts uh, for the university as a whole with a quote from a long ago former president of the university who made the decision uh, to take the U of C out of the Big Ten. And the t-shirt reads, uh, the quote is, whenever I get the urge to exercise, I sit down until it goes away. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Um, and when I started at the University of Chicago, it wasn't exactly a bastion of liberalism, right? Uh, but I thought it was important to hear that diversity of opinion and thought, and that was one of the major reasons that I went there. It also didn't really have a touchy-feely reputation. In fact, for many years, the Green Lounge, uh, where the students uh, sit and are supposed to get together and talk, uh, they actually had the chairs back to back to minimize interaction so that everyone would study. Uh, but despite all of that, um, we actually had a wonderful time, my class. Uh, we got to be very good friends. Our class of 170, which the law professors called the happy class, which I thought was a really nice thing until I found out that they meant that they didn't think we were going to produce as many Supreme Court clerks. Um, but we did produce one U.S. senator and one FBI director, as in Jim Comey. True story, out of our class. 
So I know that you've already heard from a number of distinguished speakers, including Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Elizabeth Warren, or as I like to call them, my warm-up act. <laughs> so the last time I spoke here, I was uh, the only senator uh, from Minnesota, and now I'm one of two. And so I do bring you greetings from our state, uh, where in the words of our poet laureate, Garrison Keillor, uh, the women are strong, the men are good looking, and you can ask Franken about this, all the recounts are above average. Uh, now, of course, Al Franken is now the junior senator from my state, and I know he addressed uh, this convention a few years back, and I really want to thank the person who, when I walked in, said, oh, are you going to be as funny as Al Franken? That was really, really nice. Uh, thank you for that. Um, in fact, you know it is not always easy having the other senator as a celebrity. When I first got to the Senate, um, when he first got elected after the recount, uh, Senator Durbin and Schumer actually set up a meeting with me. This is a true story. They're like, you know, it's not as easy as you think uh, having the other senator. You need to be ready for it. I said, they said, well, you know, Dick said my other senator is Barack Obama, and um, Chuck says my other senator is Hillary Clinton, and, you know, this just it was, and it just wasn't easy. They said, you know, you walk in the airport and your constituents go, will you take a photo of me with them, you know? <laughs> okay, so, and I actually thought I was doing pretty well until Al and I got on a flight, a Delta flight bound from D.C. to Minnesota one night, full of Minnesota, full of Minnesotans, um, although the flight attendant and the crew was from Atlanta. And we literally got on the plane and she announces, well, everyone, we've got celebrities on the plane, Mr. and Mrs. Al Franken. So, so everyone's laughing and Al finally says, no, 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 no. She is the other senator from Minnesota. And the flight attendant says, how cool is that? Husband and wife senators. <laughs> so that is for the person that said that as I walked in. Thank you very much. Uh, so, Professor Stone, a lot has happened since I took your evidence class in law school. I practiced law in the private sector for 13 years. I served as a chief prosecutor of the largest county in Minnesota for eight years and I became the first woman elected to the United States Senate from the state of Minnesota. And throughout, throughout my journey through the public and private law sectors, I've always been proud of our judiciary in Minnesota, we have some people here, through Republican and Democratic presidents, Republican and Democratic governors, uh, we have had a high standard for our judges. They are fair and smart. And I always figured that my job as a prosecutor was to convict the guilty and protect the innocent. And that doesn't happen unless you have good judges. So that is why when I got to the Senate and as a member of the Ju Judiciary Committee, I've made it my life's mission to try to get those same kind of judges confirmed. And I was honored to help with both of our last Supreme Court nominees. Um, and I literally got one of the last federal district judges done. Uh, that would be our Minnesota nominee, Judge Mimi Wright, uh, who's quite a star. Um, despite a last minute lob from the Heritage Foundation, um, in which she had gone through the committee unanimously, no objections, and at the very last minute, three days before the vote came to the floor, uh, the Heritage Foundation announced they were scoring her, uh, based solely on a law review article that she had been questioned about at the committee that she had written decades before and had written thousands of opinions since, but this was the reason, and it was just about the Reagan housing policies. One, that was all it was, okay? Um, but it just sort of sets up the argument I'm going to make here. I was able to convince a number of Republicans, including Mitch McConnell, to vote for her. Uh, but it was close for a while. We didn't know what was going to happen. And it just shows the kind of thing that we're up against here. And I have literally had a front seat uh, to see the fraying along the edges of our democracy, uh, which is having an enormous impact on our judiciary. For years, we're seeing a political creep into the selection process with 
potential nominees banned from consideration because they made one decision on a case about a hot button issue, whether it's guns, whether it's abortion, or had a difficult case, a murder case, sex case, a case where it's very complicated to explain what happened. Sometimes they don't even get considered. And politics is increasingly preventing our judicial branch from functioning with judicial nominees left languishing in a confirmation wasteland. We have 83 federal court openings and over 50 people waiting for confirmation. And this year, how many have we confirmed? Six district judges, one circuit judge, and two on the Court of International Trade. That is less than the eggs that you have in a carton. That is nine people that we've confirmed this year. And now up front and center, we see the Republican candidate for President of the United States engaging in an all-out frontal attack on a sitting federal judge just because he made a ruling that he didn't like. And he bases his attacks not on facts, not on the law, but on the man's Mexican heritage. My friends, this is a moment in time like no other. A moment where if we don't stand up and fight and if we don't take on this hateful rhetoric and blatant attempt to undermine the rule of law, we will be left with no rule of law at all. We will be left with being governed not by law, but by decrees issued on Donald Trump's Twitter feed. <laughs> now, Aristotle, an early adopter of the Socratic method, once said, <laughs> I'm just kind of bringing it back to law school, once said, law should govern. So it has. The rule of law begets democracy, and once established, the strength of a democracy is measured by the steadfastness of its rule of law. When our founding fathers sat down to sketch out the framework of our nation, they didn't issue decrees. No, they set up a system of governance upheld by three co-equal branches. The Federalist Papers outline this balance of power in detail. Alexander Hamilton, I do note that uh, Vice President Biden also quoted Hamilton. I wonder why we both quoted him. Huh? Uh, the same guy that gets to stay on the $10 bill and who more than 200 years after his time has become a Broadway sensation, giving all of us in Washington hope. Uh, he once wrote, he once wrote about this balance in detail. He said this, the regular distribution of power into distinct departments, the introduction of legislative balances and checks, the institution of courts composed of judges holding their offices during good behavior, he wrote, they are means and powerful means by which the excellences of Republican government may be retained and its imperfections lessened or avoided. But our democracy only works when this branch is independent, when this branch can function. Now it's true it may be strange to be lectured about a functioning government by a member of the legislative branch. Uh, in fact, we have had some rough times in recent years. My lowest point was actually the fiscal cliff night when we voted until uh, three in the morning and there we were at midnight, right, New Year's Eve, uh, that magical moment. I literally get to the Senate floor. I look to my left, I see Harry Reid. I look to my right, I see Mitch McConnell. Every girl's dream on New Year's <laughs> Eve. So I thought, you know, it couldn't get much worse than that. We got out of that. But then we got, uh, then we got to the shutdown. Thank you, Ted Cruz. Uh, but that really was a moment, because after that, uh, the public got so pissed off, a group of us, 14 of us, led by Susan Collins and myself, formed the Common Sense Caucus of 14 of us, half women, and we came up with a solution, brought it to the leadership, said we have the press gallery reserved, and if you guys don't do something, we're going to go out there in three hours. And guess what? We got out of the shutdown. Uh, we then passed a budget, and we have... Um, we have, in just the past uh, few years, actually passed some bills, the sex trafficking bill that I led with uh, Senator Cornyn, No Child Left Behind changes, the doctor's fix, the transportation bill, the budget bill. We actually have had a string of kind of mid-level uh, victories and gotten uh, bills passed. Um, but I think we all know um, that um, that is not enough. And one of the things that has really bothered me um, because I have ha had enormous respect for my friends across the aisle. I have worked extensively across the aisle. I do have respect for our senators, and I believe uh, that many of them are there for the right reasons. 
And we have people like my friend Lindsey Graham, who during the Supreme Court confirmation process says, look, I'm John McCain's best friend. I wouldn't have picked uh, either Sotomayor or Kagan, but they are the nominees in front of me, and I have a job to do, and my job is to advise and consent, and I believe they are qualified to do the job, and he voted for those two nominees. That is courage. That is someone doing their job. And that is why it has stunned me that so many of my Republican colleagues refuse to hold a hearing and an up or down vote on President Obama's nominee to the Supreme Court. This has been our practice in the Senate for over 100 years, since we started having hearings. In fact, since 1916, uh, we have had a hearing on every pending Supreme Court nominee, except for nine nominees who were all confirmed within 11 days. The Supreme Court simply cannot function well without a ninth justice. You know that old TV show, Eight is Enough? Well, it might be enough for a sitcom, but not for the United States Supreme Court. Uh, the impacts of an eight-person court have become evident in the past months. Split decisions, diminished decisions, delayed decisions, no decisions, and the potential for worse is real. What if Miranda v. Arizona was a 4-4 decision, or an emergency case like Bush v. Gore, or, Board, or Brown v. Board of Education? Uh, one interesting fact, the Brown decision may not have even happened if it wasn't for the swift filling of a Supreme Court vacancy. Chief Judge Justice Vinson died just before the reargument of the case. By most accounts, the eight-person eight court was split on the issue. Had the Senate refused to give Earl Warren a hearing and a vote, we wouldn't have had that decision. But the Senate allowed for a vote, and Chief Justice Warren was confirmed. The Brown decision was handed down, and our nation has seen great progress toward equality as a result. Justice Kagan. <laughs> Justice Kagan has said that the current justices on the court are doing everything that they can to build consensus and avoid a 4-4 split. And while I appreciate the effort, that's just not how it is supposed to work. We want laws to, we want laws to rise or fall because the Supreme Court has decided the issue, not because of a 4-4 split. Here's the truth. If the court is unable to reach a conclusion in a case or puts off taking on significant cases until it has a full complement of justices, the result is confusion and thus an undermining of the law. So if we see the court at eight is deadlocked or diminished and if we respect the Constitution, what is stopping us from holding a hearing and a vote? I've tried to put myself in the shoes of my Republican colleagues. I thought, okay, what if it was reversed? What if we had a Democratic Senate and a Republican president and a justice died suddenly out of the blue? What would I do? And I have said publicly that once the nominee was put forward, I would demand a hearing. It doesn't mean how you will vote. It doesn't mean that you'll embrace this nominee, but we must have a hearing and we must have a vote. This, my friends, is about politics, and that's what scares me. It is also about fear. Listen to this story. A few months back, two of the Republicans had said that they wanted to have hearing, two of the Republican senators. And then suddenly, I remember we were on research, recess, one of my other colleagues said he wanted a hearing, and I literally was naive enough to think, wow, this must be a plan. They're all going to say this. Wow, this is good. He said it in his home state. He said it in front of home journalists. And it was all reported. And there was an immediate backlash from the right. Immediately, it was said that he was going to get a strong primary, that money, money, outside dark money, was going to be put on the table. Well, do you know what happened? Within a few days, he said he was wrong, that he didn't want a hearing anymore, that he didn't want to vote anymore. And that's why we not only have to get a new justice, but we have to pass a constitutional amendment overturning Citizens United. This is the force. This outside money is literally turning courageous legislators into meek ones. It's making it very difficult to compromise, really from both sides, because the outside money is so big and it overwhelms anything that you may raise in your own campaign. That's why we in the Senate have repeatedly told our Republican colleagues that it is the time to do their jobs. 
Now to turn to the nominee uh, before the Senate, Judge Merrick Gar Garland. I can't think of a better nominee for these polarized times. Like many of my colleagues, I had the privilege to meet with Judge Garland. I was impressed with his knowledge of the law, his fair-mindedness, and his commitment to finding common ground. His ability to build consensus has earned him bipartisan praise throughout his career. He was confirmed with a strong majority uh, from both parties, Senator Orrin Hatch, uh, who I considered a friend, uh, consider a friend, a little sideline to Orrin Hatch. Uh, he and I, uh, a few years back, were voted by the Washington Washingtonian magazine as the two senators least likely to get into a scandal. <laughs> so really, that's a high bar around here, and, and I assume that includes with each other. But anyway, in any case, Senator Hatch uh, once challenged his colleagues. He said, I would like to see one person come to this floor and say one reason why Merrick Garland does not deserve this position. And Chief Justice Roberts explained that, quote, any time Judge Garland disagrees, you know you're in a difficult area. This man has broad legal experience, including as a judge, a prosecutor, and in private practice. He's dedicated his life to public service. As many of you know, he supervised two of the biggest cases of the century. That's the Unabomber case and the Oklahoma City bomber. For all of these reasons, some of my colleagues, when both Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor were nominated, told me off the record, well, if it was, you know, I can't vote for them, but, you know, if it was Judge Garland, I'd vote for him. I can't tell you how many people said that. So why will many of them not even meet with him now? Well, my friend Angus King, the independent senator of Maine, recently said, I don't understand what people are worried about if they have meetings or hearings. Are they afraid they'll like him? <laughs> yes, that may be part of it, but perhaps what our Republican colleagues are most afraid of is that an open hearing will allow the American people to see this well-respected judge as someone who knows his stuff and deserves a seat on the court. Will his answers be just too sensible to counter, too smart to criticize, too good to resist? There's only one way to find out, and that is give him a hearing. I was there in the Rose Garden when President Obama announced Judge Garland as his choice for the Supreme Court. That was 85 days ago, but who's counting? Uh, when I saw Judge Garland tear up, little tears coming out of his eyes, I thought that for this man, this is more than about the honor of being nominated for this incredible job on the highest court of the land. This is about the burden he had agreed to carry, the burden to stand up for a judiciary that's independent in this polarized time. Judge Garland should not be shouldering that burden alone. We in the United States Senate should have the courage to give him a hearing and a vote. We all share in this burden. So in addition to this respect for the law that is so important, which the idea that you're gathered here today and that had these incredible discussions as you go back home, this respect for the law, I think you all know, uh, is really important. But I wanted to touch on one last value. Uh, when I look back at my time as a lawyer in both the public sector and the private sector, I realized that I learned respect for the law and the Constitution, not always from the books that I read or the cases that I cited. It was, in fact, from the experience of having to make legal decisions on the front line. When I was working in the private sector, I'd find myself on one side of a government agency's or competing business on one day, and then on the other side the next. If you burned bridges with your counsel, with the people that you worked with, you would soon be left standing on the wrong side of the river. And as a prosecutor, I learned respect for the victims that we worked with every day, uh, for these incredible people that I worked with uh, in the DA's office, and for the defense lawyers who would take on these heart-wrenching cases and so often do it simply because they believed in the principle of due process and the law. And in the end, I learned that, especially when it came to charging or sentencing decisions, the law was paramount. If we wanted to show respect to the people that we represented, we had to do it with fairness and justice, and that meant respecting the law and respecting the people in front of us. 
So the other value that we must not simply tolerate, but we must embrace, is respect for others. It is common decency. Respect for people of different political views, different backgrounds, different religions, different ethnic backgrounds, different races, respect. Decency in how we deal with people and what we say to them and what we say about them when they're not there. You know, the stuff that you learn from your parents, uh, that you learn from Sunday school, that you learn from your teachers. The stuff my mom taught her second graders until she was 70 years old. It is unconscionable that we're hearing so much disrespect these days, even from a presidential candidate of a major political party, calling Mexican immigrants rapists and drug dealers, wanting a complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States, looking to build a wall across our southern border and our northern border. Oh, I forgot, that, that's the wrong guy. That, that guy uh, who said that lives next door to me. He's the governor of Wisconsin. and. Um, <laughs> You may not remember this, but in Minnesota, we can see Canada from our porch. So it was like a really big deal. So I am especially uh, tuned into this issue because my state is the home to so many refugees and immigrants. Minnesota has the largest Somali population in the United States of America, the largest Liberian population, the second largest Hmong population. We cherish these people. They are part of the fabric of life in our state. They work hard, they raise their families, they deserve respect. Today, conflicts in Syria, Somalia, South Sudan, and the Central African Republic have driven millions more refugees from their homelands. In Syria alone, more than half of their 23 million people have been forced from their homes. Nearly 5 million Syrians are registered as refugees, and nearly 7 million are displaced within Syria. More than half of those affected are children, many of whom are under the age of 5. More than 14,000 Syrian children have been killed. I have visited refugee camps in Jordan and Turkey that currently house hundreds of thousands of Syrians. We have heard from men, women, and children who have witnessed atrocities that, in the words of one refugee I talked to, would make stones cry. I have been in Lesbos, seen the refugees teeming onto the shores of Greece, seen the videos from the Greece Greek Coast Guard, where they actually showed us video of smugglers bringing in these ships of refugees, and when the Coast Guard started to chase them, to stop them, do you know what they do? They dump a kid over the side. I've seen the videos. You can see them on YouTube. They dump a kid over the side, so the Greek Coast Guard is forced to go rescue that child, sometimes unsuccessfully, and is then deterred from going after the smugglers. That is happening in our world today. It is critical that the United States steps up. Senator Durbin and I have led our colleagues in calling on the administration to increase the number of Syrian refugees our nation accepts for resettlement. And while the administration has made a commitment to accept at least 10,000 Syrian refugees by the end of this year, we are lagging behind in meeting that goal. Canada is meeting their goals. That's my last Canadian reference. Uh, but we are not. Of course, we need to carefully vet the refugees who resettle here, and an enhanced review program has been created specifically for the Syrian refugee uh, population. Yet I will never forget the letter that we received last December from more than 1,000 American rabbis urging us to support refugee resettlement and to oppose measures that had come over from the House, by the way, we did successfully oppose them, to halt resettlement or prohibit or restrict funding for any groups of refugees. The rabbis noted, in 1939, our country could not tell the difference between the actual enemy and the victims of an enemy. In 2016, let us not make the same mistake. What will lead us to another mistake? Callousness, allowing the hateful rhetoric to go unresponded to, silence. We must be strong, and being strong means not only going after those who want to destroy us, but also standing by the innocents among us. Remember this, immigrants and refugees are an entrepreneurial force in America. 
Look at the Fortune 500 companies. More than 70 of those companies were founded by immigrants. And at one point, 200 were founded by immigrants or kids of immigrants. And 25%, over 25% of our US Nobel laureates were born in other countries, not to mention six Supreme Court justices. America cannot afford to shut out the world's talent, and that's why passing comprehensive immigration reform is a vital step for our security, our economy, and our nation, as is keeping our doors open to refugees. Now, I, we all have our own stories in this room. My story, my uh, Slovenian, Great-grandparents got here. They were worked in the mines their whole life. They were legal when they got here. On the Swiss side, who ever heard of a legal Swiss immigrant? I got it. <laughs> On the Swiss side, uh, my grandma came over. My direct grandma came over when she was three years old with her parents, but my grandpa came over when he was 18. And when I was doing the research for this book, I got all the papers from Homeland Security. And that was when I realized that he came over to Ellis Island and there had been, they had reached the max of Swiss immigrants. So there he is uh, on the, with his friend. They're 18 years old. And so, oh, I promise my last reference is not. So what do you think they said they were going to? Canada. They said they were going to Canada. They signed a thing. They go to Canada. They stay there for like five days. And then they somehow come through another entry point. And he was an alien for most of his time. 20 years go by. He's an alien. He marries my grandma. He could have been applied for citizenship. He doesn't. He remains an alien because he doesn't know what's going to happen because of how he entered this country. Then World War II starts breaking out. They have, make them register. Remember this? They had the Alien Registration Act. And he has to register. The family's scared to death. He registers as an alien. He's all emboldened, so he decides to apply for citizenship. He applies for citizenship, and they ask him, what organizations do you belong to? Because they're trying to root out communists, and he has one answer, the Swiss male choir of Milwaukee. <laughs> but in any case, that is when they discover that he had these two entry points, that he wasn't really, really honest when he filled out that form. But somehow back then, they said, you're okay. They let him through, and there's a little smiling picture of him with a little bow tie the day he got his citizenship. That is the story of the United States of America two weeks before they bombed Pearl Harbor. My grandpa was made a citizen. So unfortunately for our immigrants and our refugees today, um, the embrace that my grandparents felt has too often been replaced with hateful rhetoric. So I'm asking you today, my last ask, is to take this on. It's easy to talk to your friends here and nod your heads, right? Oh, great speech. Oh, yeah, that's good. Well, I am asking you to do more. Uh, when you go home to find like-minded people, and by the way, they are not all Democrats. There are Republicans that feel the same way about this. And to reach out to different people, different religions, anyone, find those people who still believe in civility and decency uh, and respond when you read this stuff on Facebook or Twitter. I know it's not fun, but do it. And respond when you hear someone say something at the workplace when you just kind of want to go, well, that's what he's like. The problem is they're saying it and other people are hearing it and you have to respond. So I'll end with this. I recently visited a mosque in Minneapolis. It was a few uh, weeks ago. And there I heard a story of a family. And I, by the way, was the prosecutor right after 9-11. The Bush US attorney and I went around. We talked to people. We assured them we'd be there. If there were hate crimes, there were some minor ones. We responded. And there did nothing like what we're seeing now, right? It's not just Muslims that are getting bullied or yelled at or but told to leave. Uh, it is anyone. It is Hindus, it is Buddhists, it is Hispanics, it is like, you know, I, I talked to one Italian guy with a beard uh, that it happened to. So this story is a Muslim family of four. They go out to eat for dinner, and this guy just walks by, and he says, you four, you go home. You go home to where you came from. And the little girl looks up at her mom, and she says, Mom, you said that we could go out to dinner tonight. I don't want to eat dinner at home. <laughs> You think of the innocent words of that child. She said that because she only knows one home. Her home is in Minnesota. Her home is in the United States of America. So this is a moment in time where we stand up for that little girl and say, yes, this is your home. And we stand up 
for Judge Garland, and we stand up for Judge Curiel, and we stand up for the people of this country that call America home. So let's embrace the Constitution, embrace respect for the law, and respect for each other. And thank you so much for allowing me to share a few minutes with you today.